Welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast, where powerful women are interviewed every week to share real inspiring stories and incredible insight to help women or anyone break the barriers, be a part of innovation, shatter the glass ceiling, and dominate to the top of their sport, industry, or life's mission. Join us as we celebrate exceptional women and step into our power. And now, here's your host, Angela Gennari. Hello, and welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast. My name is Angela Gennari, and I am here with Adriana Gavazzoni. How are you? Hello, Angela. Fine. Thanks for having me today. Okay, so say your name one more time, just to make sure I'm getting it correct. Adriana Gavazzoni. Gavazzoni, that's correct. Beautiful. Okay, perfect. So let me introduce God. Adriana to you. Adriana is a highly respected Brazilian attorney, former law school professor, and author of a textbook on international contract law. But her passion has always been to write fiction. And thanks to a personal crisis, she finally gave herself permission to chase that dream. She had to not only face the usual fears that most authors have, but in addition, the fear that how her work could negatively affect her career. Brazil is a male-dominant country, and their legal profession is very conservative. But she did it, and she has become a best-selling, award-winning author of legal thrillers, as well as historical romances. She is also an expert on work-life balance, managing her legal career, writing, several personal pursuits, and helping to manage her large Brazilian-Italian family. She has a one. She is a wonderful storyteller that you are going to fall in love with. So thank you so much, Adriana, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Angela. Thanks a lot. I think it's going to be a great day for us. Yes, absolutely. So what got you started in law? Let's start there. What what drew you into the legal profession? Oh, that's a long time ago. I was 12 years <laughs> old. Always, always a voracious reader. Mm. Uh, it was vacation time in Brazil. It was night, I didn't have anything to read, and I found a legal book on my father's shoulder. So yeah. I decided, yeah, I decided to read it, and I fell in love with laws and roles, and I thought, oh my God, I love that. Oh, Who works awesome. with that? <laughs> so my father said, lawyers work with that, and I say, so I'm going to be a lawyer. And I laugh, I was too young. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, from that on, I was, I knew I was going to be an attorney. I was going to be a lawyer. Oh, that's wonderful. Was your father an attorney? No, no, not at all. <laughs> he just happened to have books that were kind of legal driven, huh? Yes, because my father was a politician uh -huh. and he was just study some laws to prepare contracts and laws uh, for the city hall. So that's the reason he had that. And uh, uh, but uh, he he's not a lawyer. I don't have any lawyers wow. <laughs> next to me in my family. I'm the wow. first one. Well, good for you. That's amazing. So as you're building your law career, I know it's male dominated. Did you have any struggles being a female climbing into that career as you're starting to build your career? Yes. Uh, first of all, I got into the university when I was 17. Wow. On that, on that time, there were a, a majority of male uh, in law, law school. So from that moment on, I knew it was not going to be easy. Right. But then uh, it was worse. I graduated with 21 years old. Oh. And went immediate, immediately I got a, a job on, uh, in a ministry. I was working for the government. Everybody was much, much older than I was. A male universe. I had problems with a boss. Yeah. He harassed me back then. I had to sue him. So since I was, uh, I can say a, a kid, 21, 22 years old, you are a kid not prepared yeah. for life. Right. I had, I had to stand for myself and I had to learn how to deal with a male world that is law. Yeah. 
Wow. Well, good for you. That's amazing. So then you're practicing law. You've got a very successful career. You're, you're writing a textbook. You're a law school professor. You have this amazing career. And then you have a crisis that leads you into writing fiction. So tell me a little bit about that path. Well, I always dreamed about writing a novel, not mm. to publish a novel, just to write. Because I think when you you love to read, yeah. you think you always cherish that idea that one day I'm going to write one novel. And when I arrive at the middle life crisis, everybody is going to arrive around four to four, four to five years old. You realize maybe you don't have another half of time mm -hmm. you, you are, you, I don't know if I'm going to live to 90 so I thought I need to fulfill my dreams oh, but I was a little bit a little bit scared of writing and one of my lawyers told me he was writing a novel huh. and so I told him I'm also writing mine it was a <laughs> I wasn't, but I thought, come on, he's a kid, he's, he has the courage, you have to have the courage, so I yeah. decided to start writing, wow. and uh, I didn't know what to do with that book, I didn't know which kind of book I wanted to write, so I decided to listen to my heart and ask myself, which kind of books do you love to read? Okay, I love mystery. Mm. I love psychological thrillers. Uh, I, and then I started to write and I thought, hmm, some sex would be good. Everybody loves sex. So right. I, I start adding things I love to find in a book. Yeah. And suddenly I had my, my book ready. And uh, in six months, I wrote my first novel. Wow. Six months. That's incredible. I, wow. Yes. And it was, it was incredible because I have a tight schedule. Yeah. I, I had to find the time. So I decided uh, best time for me to write is early in the morning. Mm -hmm. So every day I wake up and I have my breakfast and then I write for one hour okay. before, before going back to real life mm -hmm. and working mm -hmm. as a lawyer. But that's how I got my first novel. Wow, good for you. You know, I've been toying with the idea of writing for so long. And I keep telling it, I keep saying that it's my 20 year work in progress because it's the easiest thing to do is set aside your dreams. You think, oh, there's this huge mountain in front of me and there's a, a hundred other priorities that I have to do. And that's just something that I want to do. And so we quickly put our wants behind our have tos. And you're right. Like there's a there's a time in your life when you start saying it's now or never. Yes, and uh, giving excuses like I have to do this and yeah. I can't do that is right. easy for us, yeah, human beings, because we are scared. Yeah, to do something different. It's better keeping doing what we must do because we know what we must do uh -huh. than what we really want to do. So uh, to separate the time in my schedule was the first thing to do and to, to, to put my imagination on, on the paper, on the screen, uh, I, when I started, I thought, hey, and if anybody likes and if it's awful, but after the first, first chapter, I thought, okay, I'm writing for myself. Okay. Yeah. I'm not writing for others. It's a dream. I don't yeah. know what is going to happen to this ring. So I have to do it for mm -hmm. myself. Yeah, And then the excuses that. were over. And in six months, I have one. Six more, I have the second. Uh, then I went into a, a, a huge family problem. The third one took me a, a year to write because mm. I was really having to manage this Italian family with <laughs> lots of problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible. I love I love your tenacity in prioritizing something that means so much to you. Uh, because I think 
you're right. It comes down to fear. You know, part of my issue with not really putting my book out there is I'm afraid that people will hate it. You know, I'm afraid that I'll I'll spend all this time working on something and people will tell me it's terrible. And so it's scary. It's scary to think that, you know, something that is so personal to you could be judged by others. And so that's, it's a scary thing. It's a scary and we don't know if it's good enough. We never know. No, Mm -mm. but one thing I discover: some people are going to love you, Mm -hmm. some people are going to hate you, but it's their problem, not yours. You did your part, Mm -hmm. and when you write for yourself, like I do, I I think the majority of people are going to like because your soul is is exposed there uh, when you write for yourself you melt your soul on the paper on the screen so people can feel that yeah absolutely so how many books have you written so far three uh five <laughs> wow five wow five five okay. I, I, a trilogy mm-hmm. that is, they are psychological and erratic thrillers and then I decided to pick one of the characters from this novel and write about her life. Huh. But when I had, I had to do the chronology to know when she was born, and she was born in the middle of two great wars. Oh. So it is historical, but not because I like to write historical, but because I have to start from there on. Mm hmm. Interesting. Okay. So is there a lot of research that goes into it then? A lot of research for all my books. Uh, mm-hmm. I was uh, a professor. So I'm used uh, to research to tell the truth to my students. And it couldn't be different writing a novel. Uh, right. From my, my, tri- my trilogy, the, the main character is, is a psychiatrist. So I had to research. I couldn't tell my reader, oh, that's the right thing. Put words uh, on her mouth. She's a psychiatrist. She's a no psychiatrist. I I can't uh, give advices or better, my character couldn't give advices that I didn't research about. So every case, every patient, I really research a lot to compose them. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. So then, so you're writing your books, you have, you have finished it at six months. Did you self-publish? Did you go find a publisher? How did you take that next step once it was completed? I start to try to find uh, an agent, Mm -hmm. a literary agent. It's complicated. And then I start to try to send directly to publishers and I got one. Wow. Bad luck. Six months after, uh, the publisher went bankruptcy, and oh, I had no. to hire a lawyer. Oh no! <laughs> yes, oh, I no. had to hire to hire a lawyer uh, to defend my rights to get my rights back. Yes. Uh, so I was scared. I decided to go self-publish. Yes. I decided to manage everything. And that's what I've been doing since my my first novel. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yes, and I know you have a really good Amazon. Um, you have all of your your books published on Amazon. So I did see that. So um, and those links will be shared on our on our website as well. So um, so okay, great. So then who through your journey, you know, you, you have so much going on. You went from law and that now you're a writer, published author. So who inspires you? Uh, strong women. Strong I always women. write about strong women. Uh, I was raised by a strong mother. Oh, uh, yeah. She was always a professional. She's a fighter. Uh, so I admire strong women. Yeah, uh, I, I can write about weak characters because mm-hmm. my inspiration comes from those women that can be father and mother, uh, that can fend for themselves, that can fight uh, to build a career, uh, that uh, can choose their own path in life and are not depending on men. 
Mm. Uh, for happiness, they are always trying to build their own happiness. That inspires me a lot. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love it when you can read a book um, where the woman is is strong, you know, and isn't somebody who just needs to be rescued and, you know, helpless. <laughs> strong women, I think uh, we, sh- we need more of those in novels for sure. Yes, yes, because I think our girls must be inspired not by princes mm-hmm. uh, that need to be rescued by a, a, a charming prince. <laughs> they need to know a marriage is not a career. Uh, if you have a career, you can do everything you want because you are paying your bills. Right. Nobody is going to choose what we are going to eat, where we are going to travel. You can do that by yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think we need to inspire the, this new generation uh, to get uh, their life on their hands, yes. in their hands, and fight for what they believe. Absolutely. Even if it's motherhood, if it's motherhood, okay. Yeah. But it must be your choice. Yes. Uh, it can be uh, uh, other people's choice for your life. I decided, yeah. for example, not to have kids. Uh huh. I didn't want. But I could afford that because I live my own life. Right. Well, and I think that's so important that when we get to make those decisions for ourselves, then we can direct it a little bit easier. You know, when your life is dependent on somebody else's decisions made on your behalf, you have very little voice in that. You may think you do, but at the end of the day, if you don't have your own money, if you don't have your own uh, career, and even if that happens to be, you know, if I'm if I'm raising children, like I, I, if that's what you choose that you want to do, then wonderful for you. But like you said, make sure it's a choice. Make sure it's not just forced upon you um, as an expectation. Yes, and I think that's that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. So as you are going through your career um, and you're in a very male dominated space, how would you compare what are the differences in your day to day lifestyle, work life balance from being an attorney to writing? And are you doing both continuously? Yes, I'm still an attorney. Okay. (laughs) All right. And I work on daily basis, mostly with men. Uh Uh, The majority of my clients are men. Uh, when you are a lawyer and you work with men, you have always to take care of everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Your clothes, how you behave, the words you use for not having a misinterpretation. So uh, it's a lot of, uh, how can I say that? Uh, It's a lot of being an actress also mm-hmm. <laughs> because you're always representing the serious attorney, the responsible attorney. And when I enter into the imagination world of being a writer is where I find freedom. Yes. I can write about anything. I can be whomever I want to be. I can create characters and they can lead their life the way they want. Uh, so it's hard when I have to come back to reality. Yes. Because when whenever I'm writing, uh, it's like I'm being abducted by a spaceship. <laughs> yeah. And then I have to go back to Earth yeah. after some time. <laughs> yes. It's hard. Uh, it's so pleasurable for me to write. It's so spontaneous. Uh, not that I don't love law. I love law since ever, but I have to have more more attention. I have mm-hmm. to play more when I'm a lawyer, and I yes. don't need to play that when I'm writing or when I'm dancing yeah. or when I'm with my dogs. It's the pleasure part of my existence. Yes. Yeah. So you love to dance. Uh, you mentioned, is it tango that you love? What is yeah, that? Yeah, I, I dance tango. It's oh, an that's Argentinian awesome. dance. It's tragic. Uh, I love, I love it. I can express myself a lot through this dance. Yeah. I don't so, know how to dance samba, but no. tango, yeah. 
So what led you into dancing? How long have you been dancing? Oh, well, uh, I've been dancing since I was a kid because I'm one of those, those people who don't know how to walk smoothly. I uh -huh. walk very hard. Uh, so my mother decided I had to study a little bit of ballet oh. in order to be more feminine, something uh -huh. like that. I couldn't stand. I, I, I was studying classic ballet for one week. Mm -hmm. I decided to change to modern. Yes. I think something, ballet dance, tango, but... Uh, ten years ago, I fell in love with tango, and for me now, it's tango, and I love that. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, I've been dancing for a long time. I started dancing when I was younger, and you know, I've always, I'm always so serious in my roles in work, but I find dancing to be such a, a great expression of creativity and just, you know, it just allows you to kind of release that energy that you know is built up when you have to play a certain role all day long. But I dance in my kitchen when I'm cooking. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I dance all the time. <laughs> when I'm cooking, I sing. No, oh, nice. when I sing, I don't dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then tell me a little bit more, because you, you brought up a topic, and I kind of want to talk about this a little bit, because I was literally having this conversation with somebody the other night. And they were arguing that there's no difference in men and women in a social setting. And that, you know, when, like, as I say, at a party, it's frustrating because if I want to talk about work and politics and economy and finances, I typically will have to gravitate towards the men because the women are very rarely talking about stuff like that. The women are typically talking about their household, their kids, the teachers, the school, the bus driver. And none of that is really, you know, something that I can engage in long, you know, like I, I can maybe have a very brief conversation, but it's just not deep enough for me to really want to go into <laughs> for a long conversation. And so, um, but he said, well, it's because that's, that's just what you choose to talk about. I'm like, no, it's, it's truly not a conversation that is welcomed in female circles. And, and I said, but it's also, um, cause we were talking about the differences in a woman building a business and a man building a business. And I said, women have to seek out mentors. We have to seek out people who will have conversations with us. And typically those, com those are not women because like I said, at a, at a social event, a lot of the women are not talking about politics, business, work, finances, all those things that are going to move the needle if you're trying to start a business. Um, and so you'll have to gravitate towards men or for a mentor. I wish more women would step up and mentor other women because you don't see it a whole lot. And the other issue is that as a woman, like you brought up, it's awkward for us, right? Because if you're a woman in a male dominated space, you can't just ask somebody, Hey, do you want to go have lunch? Because they think you're asking them on a date or they think there's some kind of romantic interest there. And there could not be further from the truth, right? Like I have no interest in, in somebody, but if I say, Hey, can we go grab a coffee sometime? I'd like to talk through this. Their mind flips to she must be into me, right? And that is not Yeah, that, that, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Because I, I have the same problem. I love to talk about politics. I'm mm -hmm. a daughter of a former politician. So politics is always in my life since I, I know myself. Right. So but to talk about all the subjects, I have to go to men, talk yeah. to men. And... Uh, it's all about their brains I'm interested about. Yes. But if I say, hey, you could continue to discuss this over coffee, over lunch. My God, the next thing they are going to think is, mm, she wants me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I wish that that was not even on the table. But, you know, if another man said to them, hey, let's go grab lunch. We can talk more about this. They would think nothing of it. But if it comes from a woman, forget it. She obviously wants to sleep with me. <laughs> right? So. Yes, yes, of course. She wants to have something with me. Right. I'm so perfect. So wonderful. <laughs> it's not my mind. She is interested in right. It's my body. Of and course. Usually that happens a lot. The oldest, the man, the more they are going to think yes. like that. 
the new generation, they are more prepared for that. I think mm -hmm. I'm 53 years old. So <laughs> I think the new new generation is better. Yeah. They are more prepared uh, to deal with independent mm -hmm. women, uh, with an invitation for lunch, just for chatting. Yeah. But uh, the older, uh, the oldest generation, oh, it's tough. They yeah. really think you need another husband in your life. And I know. Probably <laughs> it's what you are going to try to, to have with them over lunch. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find solutions, not more problems. So <laughs> the last thing I want is complicating anything. So, yeah, I agree. But yes, I find that interesting. So when you brought up that, you know, that was always a factor in how you, you know, had to, had to behave, how you had to portray yourself. It's so accurate because I'm the same way, you know, and, and it actually reflects, you know, for me in dating, because I have a hard time being relaxed enough in front of men because I'm in front of men so much with work, you know? And so I have this persona that I have to have all the time. I cannot come across as flirty or, you know, anything like that. I have to really kind you of can... maintain this very stoic, you know, attitude. And then, you know, I try to date and it's like trying to turn that off and on is very challenging. <laughs> and you can even smile as much as you would do uh, because they think, oh, she's smiling and mm -hmm. she wants something. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy, but yeah, I don't think, you know, I really don't think that men deal with that same kind of issue that we do, um, on a regular basis in, in the, no, in the they workplace. Don't, they don't, they don't, even if things are changing, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's still a male world for some professions. Sure. Uh, for mine, for example, it's a still a male world. I have to face judge. Yeah. I have to face, uh, other lawyers, and you are going to be judged by the clothes you are wearing, mm -hmm. by your makeup, by the position of your hands, by everything and anything except your brains. Yes. <laughs> I'm so proud of my brains. I learned so much during my whole life. I studied so much. I've read so much. Uh, my brains are the best part I have. So please yes. try to, to try to admire that in me, not the rest. Yeah. Right? I know. I know. It's it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing issue. So tell me some of the um some of the more obstacles and challenges that you have faced in growing in your career. I think first of all, uh uh, I find respect when I was too young to be a lawyer. Yeah. I was too young. So I, I was just a kid. It was hard to convince people that if I graduated with 21 years old, yeah. uh, the meaning of that was I studied a lot. I studied yeah. hard for that. Then facing men always trying to have something with a 21, 22 years yeah. old attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I decided I didn't need on that time. Now I need to wear glasses. So I decided to have those glasses because it made me look older. Oh, to have a chin on hair. I was yeah. always disguising, always wearing suits, uh, never wearing dresses because dresses meant they were going to look to my 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 legs uh -huh. and I would have problems. Then one day I was around 23 years old. I had this boss. This boss was always commanding about my clothes and he was always being polite. And one day he decided to tell me romantic things and I told Ooh. him no. I'm yeah. not interested yeah. in that. I'm here to work. And he to shout with me that I was trying to sell myself uh, for the, the best option, that I was evaluating myself too much, that what's normal for someone who wanted to go up on, on a career, wow. uh, to go out with the boss and... Many, many awful things. I start to cry 
Wow. And I had a mentor on that yeah. time who was a great man, so ethical, so correct. So I was crying. I went to his office and I told him everything. And I said, I don't know what to do. He told me, yes, you know, you are a lawyer. You're going to sue him. <laughs> That's what you are going to do. And from now on, when a man does respect you, you are going to sue. Good for you. You're a lawyer. Remember that. Remember that. You are a good lawyer. You are young, but you are a good lawyer. So do the job. So this guy. I sold him and he lost his job. And wow. I felt great about that. And I never had to sue anybody else for harassment because I start to protect myself yeah. uh, against being too nice, too naive. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't allow any disrespectful things because uh, when he started to say, wow, that's yeah. a beautiful dress. Mm. Mm, your legs look great. I had to stop him there. Yeah. And that's what I've learned. So always, I, I'm someone who believes that every experience we have in life, it's a lesson. So mm. it was a great lesson for me. It was a great lesson. Yeah. Because early on you learned, you know, how to play the game that they're playing, you know, and unfortunately it means that we aren't necessarily being who we want to be, you know, but you, like, if I want to wear a beautiful dress, I should want to wear a beautiful dress. But, you know, I find with myself, like if that dress is too revealing or, you know, it's, it's short or whatever it is, I'm very hesitant to post it on social media or anywhere, even if I feel great in it. And the reason is because I'm afraid that clients or employees or somebody is going to see it and then take it as, you know, something that's flirtatious or, you know, putting myself out there. And that's the last thing I want to do. And so I'm very cautious about thing about how I'm portrayed by others, because I don't want that impression that, that like you said, you know, I can't be too nice. I can't be too, you know, you know, wear your hair up, not down and, you know, things like that, <laughs> that it, it's like the simplest thing, but like, you really have to think through it all. And it's a shame. Some, some, some men see seduction in the yeah. most amazing things. Uh, they are seduced by their own brains. I think. <laughs> right. I agree. All right. So as women, we often give our power away. Um, and I would think, you know, the, the time that you, that your, your boss was flirting with you and you were crying and you, you left and you talked to a mentor. I think that that was a great example of, you know, giving your power away, but then stepping back into your power, you know, because you, you then took control of that situation again. And you said, you know what, I'm going to sue him. I'm going to stand up for myself. Can you think of another time that you've given your power away as a woman? And then another time that you've stepped into your power to own that back? Uh, I think um, uh, I've, I've married four times in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one thing that I learned from my, my previous marriage oh, is that I can't uh, reduce myself to someone to please somebody. Yeah. That's the path to unhappiness. Yes. Uh, when I gave up on my marriage was when I realized I'm, I was not being myself. Oh, One yeah. thing is to control yourself in your profession. Uh, you assume a mask of a professional. Another thing is to assume a mask inside your own home because mm. you need to play somebody. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I have to do that, uh, I'm not going to stay with somebody. Uh, my 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 husband, uh, my first husband, uh, we have the ability to say everything to each other. Mm -hmm. We we don't use masks. That's the reason my marriage is last uh, is lasting for eleven years. My my previous marriage, my first marriage lasts four years. Yeah. My second marriage five years. My third one year wow. because. From the second to the, the third, I already knew what I didn't want from life. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to feel powerless. Yes. I'm a strong woman. 
and uh, I'm going. I'm going to be be like that. Places you or don't. Uh, so that there were other times we, we really it's not good to 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 brag about things. But my first medal for my first novel, I felt so powerful when I step on the stage in the United States. Remember, I was born in Brazil, raised in Brazil. I'm a Brazilian woman uh from a small town in brazil and then one day i was in miami receiving a prize for my for my first novel wow I felt so big so big so big wow. another time when i i discovered my legal book was in columbia's library wow. i was researching my book and it's like hey my book is in columbia's library can't believe and so I felt like, oh, I'm the best, I'm great. Uh, and I try to savor every victory yes. that I have. Because our tendency as women is to, oh, that's good, but that, that's not so good. Because uh, the world teaches us that we have to, to have modesty. Yes, humble. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, we must be humble. But for Christ's sake, we have to celebrate our victory. Yes, I uh, agree. There are not many in life. Victories mm -hmm. are things that we have to fight. So we have all the fight to achieve something, to buy a new car, uh, to buy a new house, to make the wonderful trip you want. Bring about it, Christ's yes. sake. At least to yourself, say, hey, See what I did, how good I am. It's great. Yes. Oh, I agree with you so much because I think we don't celebrate ourselves enough. And we we allow when somebody gives us a compliment, oh, it was nothing. Oh, you know, it's you know, oh, that's a pretty dress. Oh, I got it on sale. You know, oh, your hair looks great. Yeah. Oh, it needs to be cut. <laughs> you know, like we, we immediately <laughs> yeah, yeah. minimize. We can't, uh, we, we just can't, we, we need to learn how to accept compliments. Yes, and accept awards. Of life. Yeah. yeah, and and celebrate and our accomplishments. Good. Yeah, 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 I agree. I, I think we, we should fight do that so more. much for, for those moments of glory that yes. we deserve. Absolutely. We deserve to toast them. Absolutely, I, I agree. So what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Oh my God! Don't be so naive, kid. <laughs> <laughs> the world, the world, uh, you are going to face some bad people. Don't mm. trust people too much. Don't be too naive. Um, don't dream it's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. You have to fight. You have. Um, to expose yourself to the world. You are going to have defeats. Yes, uh, so the, many. The world is going to show you the worst way you're going to have defeats. So my advice for that girl would be don't be naive, but never give up. Mm. Never give up because one day you are going to be wherever you fight for, wherever you dream, you, 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 you will be. So yeah. never, never, never give up on your dreams. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I was uh, listening. There was a David Goggins thing I was listening today. And he said that we give up our dreams and our suffering, right? So once we get to the suffering part, you know, we're fighting for our goals and our dreams. But once it becomes really hard, that's when we give up, right? Because if you're chasing something, you have to be willing to, to pay the price for it. And, and that's what people are you know, I don't know how much they're willing to pay the price. And I believe it's the difference between failure and success. Yes. Successful people are not the people who have lucky. No. In life. <laughs> no. It's the people who work hard and work more. And work even more mm -hmm. because they can't get, they can't give up. So this is what is going to bring you success. It doesn't matter what it, what you choose to do with your life, which career, which 
path you are going through, but uh, if you give up, success will never come. You can change 10,000 professions. Yeah. You can do a thousand things that success just comes for people who fight. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you all, all the way. So tell me the names of your books. Uh, first one is Behind the Door. Okay. The second one is Lara's Journal. The third one is The Brilliant Game. That's my trilogy. Mm. Uh, then I have Sketches of Life oh, because nice. I believe our, our lives are never uh, a complete picture but they are we are always sketching it mm. and uh the other one is the last one is life has other plans because we always need to know that we plan everything we can but sometimes life has other plans for us that is so true so true all right well i've really enjoyed our conversation but i have one more question for you what do you wish more people knew uh, I wish my people knew that they can judge things before they know it deeply. That I think my trilogy is all about that. Yeah. All about never judging uh, because you never know what a person went through life. Yeah. Which trauma a person carries, why he or she behaves like this or like that. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see behind and beyond that person. So never judge before knowing. Yeah. And absolutely. my books try to convey that idea. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I would like people to know. I've learned it the, hard, the, the, the hardest way. Never judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah, never judge. I always try to see all sides and to listen to all, all people involved to try to form an opinion based on knowledge, not yeah. based on I like you or I don't like you. Right, <laughs> so, right. Is that tough as an attorney, though? Because as an attorney, aren't things mostly black and white, right? Like they're one thing or another. It's hard to find the gray area, but life is gray area. It's hard to find, uh, but even as a lawyer, where you have to defend a position, you, in order to defend well your client, you need to know all sides of the story, mm -hmm. or you're going to be surprised in the middle of a hearing, yeah. or with a witness telling something you didn't know about. So right. that's the reason you have always to listen to all sides try yeah. to understand the whole story right right and then form your your opinion and, and paint the picture as you see it very nice yes. well thank you so much adriana gavazzoni uh, is that am i saying the right gavazzoni gavazzoni you gavazzoni. said just right well thank Thanks you so lot, much Angela. it was a nice conversation I enjoyed it so much and I wish you all the most success in, in your, in your writing and in your law profession. Um, I am a huge fan. So thank you. Thank you um, for your time today. Thank you a lot. And I know you are already a success, but as a woman and from a woman to another one, be the best ever. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone have an amazing day. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Pretty Powerful Podcast. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you want to check out Adriana Gavazzoni and her books, please go to prettypowerfulpodcast.com where you will find all of her information. Thank you again. Have an amazing day. Thank you for joining our guests on the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And we hope you've gained new insight and learned from exceptional women. Remember to subscribe or check out this and all episodes on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. Visit us next time. And until then, step into your own power.